Formula cars, GT cars, prototypes, stock cars, and superbikes. Different racing disciplines produce very different machines, all with different strengths and weaknesses. But how do they stack up? Which would win in a quarter mile drag race or a top speed run? Or the biggest question I have is which would win in a race around a circuit? We've done some calculations to find out. So firstly, we should run through the cars. Starting with Formula One, our benchmark for this test. These cars have over a thousand horsepower and weigh around 800 kilograms in race trim. But as we know, they're tuned for maximum corner speed with lots of downforce. And so this may hinder it in a straight line, but pay dividends around a lap. Next is Formula 2 with very similar weight, but with less aero and less power with around 620 horsepower. Then we have its baby brother, the Formula 3 car. This has less power, but much less weight. Then we have IndyCar, Formula 1's American cousin. Similar in weight to a Formula 1 car, but with a bit less power. However, they are much more slippery in a straight line. Then we have Formula E, much less power than other Formula cars, more weight, but instant torque. These are very much designed for smaller, twistier street circuits. And that's our lot for Formula cars, next to the GTs. So we have the three classes that will be racing at Le Mans this year. The new hypercar with a hybrid system powering all four wheels. It has around 670 horsepower. Then there's LMP2, very close behind with 600 horsepower and similar weight. Then there are the GTE cars, which have 550 horsepower and weigh around 1200 kilograms. On the face of it, they look very similar to our next competitor, the GT3 car, but they're made to be extremely slippery for the long straights at Le Mans. The GT3s have a little less power than the GTEs, but have much more aero, and so might not be far off in terms of lap time. Then comes the DTM cars, the German Touring Car Championship. These are actually very similar to GTEs, so we'll see how they stack up. Then we have NASCAR, which are obviously designed with ovals in mind, but are racing on many more road circuits in recent years. And then finally, we have MotoGP, they have incredible power to weight ratios, but may lose out around the corners as there's much less rubber on the road when compared to a race car. And the first test is a 0 to 100 kilometers an hour. It wraps up the car's traction, power, torque, and weight all in one test. However, most cars actually aren't great at this. For example, a modern Tesla could give a Formula One car a good run for its money. Race cars tend to have very small, light clutches that aren't particularly good at launching. But anyway, what do you think will win? Obviously, no one has done this combination in real life, so we've stacked them up in the virtual world and compiled all of their times to see which would come out on top. The winner is actually pretty surprising. The fastest is the hypercar. It may weigh more and have less power than a Formula 1 car, but its hybrid system powers all four wheels, giving it incredible acceleration off the line. And another key factor is power to weight, and this is why you see the MotoGP bike doing well. It doesn't get a great start due to reduced traction, but it does have a better power to weight ratio than anything else here. So once the traction is down, nearly 1200 horsepower per ton powers it to actually beat the Formula One car. Now, powerful bikes do tend to be really hard to launch, but once they're off the line, the acceleration is incredible. The Formula E car does really well in this test, beating many cars with much more horsepower, but that instant torque from the electric motor must make up for it. The gaps between the rest of the pack is actually really close with the GT3 and the NASCAR bringing up the rear as they have significantly more weight than the others in this test. For me, the most surprising is the hypercar. You would expect the power and reduced weight of the Formula One car to give it the edge, but this initial acceleration is what the hypercars are best at. Up to 200 kilometers an hour, the hypercars have the advantage in a one-on-one -on -one race. But if we let them carry on, this is where the power to weight is less of an issue and the aerodynamic drag versus power becomes a bigger part of the test. This is where the F1 car really takes over. You can see that the extra power helps it claw back the time and accelerate up to a top speed of 360 kilometers an hour, where the hypercar falls short at 335. But if we let all of the others reach their top speeds, there are some interesting results. This is essentially a measure of power versus drag, and at these speeds, the force produced by slicing through the air is immense. Also, many of these cars are tuned for lap time on short tracks, and so top speed isn't massively relevant, but it's interesting to see anyway. The top speed is actually taken by IndyCar, which has less power than the Formula One car, but thanks to its very slippery body and covered rear wheels, it can reach up to 380 kilometers an hour. The MotoGP bike actually beats the Formula One car due to its much smaller frontal area, punching a smaller hole in the air. It also doesn't create any downforce, something that comes with a large drag penalty. 
The LMP2 car beats the Formula 2 car, but more interestingly, it also beats the Hypercar, a car that is a class above it in the World Endurance Championship. The margins between these two classes are really small this year. It'll be interesting to see the lap time difference between these two, where the Hypercar dominates the acceleration zone, but the LMP2 car is actually faster at the end of the straight. But acceleration and top speed is one thing. Lap time around a circuit is a whole different ball game. The cars often take different approaches to the trade-off between straight line speed and corner and grip. And we've picked Spa as the track for this battle, as the majority of cars have raced here and set representative laps in the past couple of years. And obviously Lewis Hamilton holds the lap record here from 2020 with a 1 minute 41.2, which is quite clearly the fastest car here over a lap. The fastest lap in a Formula 2 car is held by Yuki Tsunoda with a 157.6, over 16 seconds slower than the Formula 1 car. And the fastest Formula 3 lap was 7 seconds slower than this with a 2 minutes 5. We also know all of the WEC times from the 6 hours of Spa this year, so let's add them in there too. DTM and GT3s have also raced this track, but what's more difficult to predict is NASCAR, MotoGP and Formula E. As many of you will know, these cars don't race this track, and so finding data for this has been really tricky. So what we've done is compare these cars using other circuits lap times. So for example, NASCAR raced at the Circuit of the Americas this year with Tyler Reddick set in a lap of 2 minutes 12.6. And then the last Formula One time was set by Charles Leclerc in 2019 with a pole time of 1 minute 36.1. If you work this out, it turns out to be a 28% difference. And since Cota and Spa are roughly the same in terms of having long straights as well as many slow to medium speed corners, we can apply this difference to get a NASCAR time of 2 minutes and 9 seconds at Spa. Now this isn't a bulletproof estimate, but it seems to be a pretty good ballpark figure. If we do the same with MotoGP, which has raced at Red Bull Ring, we also get a 28% difference compared to Formula 1, meaning we would expect NASCAR and MotoGP to be very close in a race around Spa, and that will be good to watch. Now with Formula E, this gets a bit trickier. They tend to race much shorter tracks in Formula 1, and so this guess is a little fuzzier. The Formula E and Formula 1 times around Monaco have a difference of 23%, but this being a very short stop and start track, this wouldn't be massively representative around Spa, where the long straights would punish the Formula E car. This would make the lap time around 2 minutes 4, which seems much too fast. We would probably expect around a 2 minutes 10 to 2 minutes 20. So we went looking for some more data and interestingly, Jimmy Broadbent has lapped both the Formula E cars and the Formula 1 car around the Nordschleife in the sim. Three. This track has long straight, slow corners and everything in between and much more representative of Spa. Interestingly, this percentage comparison works out as exactly a lap time of around 2 minutes 10. Definitely a ropey estimate, but it gives us a good idea. Formula 1 may have beaten IndyCar on a circuit, but what would happen if the roles were reversed and they raced on an oval? click here to find out. Thank you very much for watching and we will catch you in the next one.